electric blanket on for anything. First, I'd be worried I might get electrocuted. No, I don't trust technology. But I mean, the main thing, Wally, is that I think that that kind of comfort just separates you from reality in a very direct way. You mean... I mean, if you don't have that electric blanket and your apartment is cold and you need to put on another blanket or go into the closet and pile up coats on top of the blanket you have, well, then you know it's cold. And that sets up a link of things. You have compassion for the per what well, is the person next to you cold? Are there other people in the world who are cold? What a cold night. I like the cold. My God, I never realized. I don't want a blanket. It's fun being cold. I can snuggle up against you even more because it's cold. All sorts of things occur to you. Turn on that electric blanket and it's like taking a tranquilizer. It's like being lobotomized by watching television. I think you enter the dream world again. I mean, what does it do to us, Wally, living in an environment where something as massive as the seasons or winter or cold don't in any way affect us? I mean, we're animals after all. I mean, what does that mean? I think that means that instead of living under the sun and the moon and the sky and the stars, we're living in a fantasy world of our own making. I mean, really, tell me, why do we require a trip to Mount Everest in order to be able to perceive one moment of reality? I mean, I mean, is Mount Everest more real than New York? I mean, is New York real? I mean, you see, I think if you could become fully aware of what existed in a cigar store next door to this restaurant, I think it would just blow your brains out. I mean, I mean, isn't there just as much reality to be perceived in the cigar store as there is on Mount Everest? I mean, what do you think? You see, I think that not only is there nothing more real about Mount Everest, I think there's nothing that different in a certain way. I mean, because reality is, is uniform in a way, so that if, you're, if your perceptions, are, I mean, if your own mechanism is, is operating correctly, it would become irrelevant to go to Mount Everest and, and sort of absurd because, I mean, it just, I mean, I mean, of course, on some level, I mean, obviously, it's very different from a cigar store on 7th Avenue. But, but I mean, well, well, I agree with you, Wally. But the problem is that people can't see the cigar store now. I mean, things don't affect people the way they used to. I mean, it may very well be that 10 years from now, people will pay $10,000 in cash to be castrated just in order to be affected by something. Well, why, why do you think that is? I mean, why is that? I mean, is it just because people are, are lazy today or they're bored? I mean, are we just like bored, spoiled children who've just been lying in the bathtub all day, just playing with their plastic duck, and now they're just thinking, well, what can I do? Okay, yes, we are bored. We're all bored now. But has it ever occurred to you, Wally, that the process that creates this boredom that we see in the world now may very well be a self-perpetuating, unconscious form of brainwashing created by a world totalitarian government based on money, and that all of this is much more dangerous than one thinks? And it's not just a question of individual survival, Wally, but that somebody who's bored is asleep, and somebody who's asleep will not say no? See, I keep meeting these people. I mean, uh, just a few days ago, I met this man whom I greatly admire. He's a Swedish physicist, Gustav Bjornstrand. And he told me that he no longer watches television, he doesn't read newspapers, and he doesn't read magazines. He's completely cut them out of his life because he really does feel that we're living in some kind of Orwellian nightmare now and that everything that you hear now contributes to turning you into a robot. And when I was at Findhorn, I met this extraordinary English tree expert who had devoted his life to saving trees. He just got back from Washington, lobbying to save the Redwoods. He's 84 years old. He always travels with a backpack because he never knows where he's going to be tomorrow. And when I met him at Findhorn, he said to me, where are you from? And I said, New York. He said, ah, New York, yes, that's a very interesting place. Do you know a lot of New Yorkers who keep talking about the fact that they want to leave but never do? And I said, oh, yes. And he said, why do you think they don't leave? I gave him different banal theories. He said, oh, I don't think it's that way at all. He said, I think that New York is the new model for the new concentration camp, where the camp has been built by the inmates themselves, and the inmates are the guards, and they have this pride and this thing they've built. They've built their own prison, and so they exist in a state of schizophrenia, where they are both guards and prisoners, and as a result, they no longer have, having been lobotomized, the capacity to leave the prison they've made or to even see it as a prison. And then he went into his pocket and he took out a seed for a tree and he said, this is a pine tree. He put it in my hand and he said, escape before it's too late. 